a buy once, cry once mentality that this customer is really used to in terms of footwear, in terms of tools and vehicles and everything around his life. He's bought, you know, a crappy drill and he, he's bought a crappy compressor. And he knows what happens when you buy, you know, low angle stuff. And, and it was a hard battle at first. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is senior editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Josh Walker and Ted D. Innocentis of 620 Workwear. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Hey guys, thanks very much for being on the show. It's nice to uh, have you here. For sure. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. I was uh, delighted to meet you guys at the recent JLC live show. Can you tell all the listeners uh, what the heck you guys do? Because I think it's pretty interesting. For sure. Ted, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I guess in a nutshell, we design, develop, uh, manufacture, and sell technical workwear. Um, everything's 100% made in USA. And, uh, you know, we're just dedicated to making the best workwear on the market. So we start with the best performance materials. We use ergonomic uh, features uh, that come from, you know, Alpine and Snow Sports and and, um, the best athletic apparel. And then really try to create products that make um, the working man's job easier. And, you know, things that they don't have to worry about on the job site like clothing. How did you guys get in the workwear business? And, And why not some other kind of garment? Yeah, long story. You know, we both have a- a- um, backgrounds in recreation um, and outdoor activities, action sports. Um, I was previously a co-founder of a helmet company called Burn Helmets. It's an action sport based helmet company, cycling brand. Um, and and you know, we had known each other for a little bit over a decade. And I'll let Ted jump in and give his background in a second here. But, um, you know, we would always had spoken about potentially starting our own company, working together in some way, shape or form. Um, we were both kind of got tired of like the recreation industry being so based on snowfall for the year, weather, um, just, we were looking for something that inherently marked it, marketed to like a category that was growing and, and had a good runway of growth. Um, and also inherently marketing to a customer that has a job. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I was selling stuff to, to, um, you know, Ski bumps. Ska- skateboarders, snowboarders, <laughs> all these kind of things. And so, um, you know, we, we kicked this around a little bit, but a, a lot of the key stuff in terms of like how it kind of came together. Um, is a little bit to do with Ted's background. I can let him jump in here. Yeah, I, um, I actually went uh, went to school for uh, ski business. Was my uh, I had a business economics degree with a concentration in ski business, and I was working for a ski wear brand in Maine and traveling and doing trade shows. And Josh and I had connected through this kind of like regional trade show network, and we were the younger guys um, and kind of gravitated towards each other just because you know we were the last ones kind of standing it. 12 at 12 at night at the, when the bars were closing and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and so, and so we became friends. And then, uh, in 2010, I actually had the opportunity to move to mainland China, uh, to work in a garment factory there. Um, and the factory really specialized in technical activity, specific apparel. So running, cycling, hunting, fishing, um, ski wear, outerwear, you know, Arcteryx was a huge customer of ours. We were, uh, yeah, like the, one of their core suppliers and, um, that was a, a really cool business, but the main cash cow of the operation uh, was a workwear uh, company from Germany, and um, they were they're the largest workwear player in Europe. And you know, basically, their premise was taking fabric from the alpine snow sports, outdoor industry, military, and applying it to you know workwear applications. And it was a company that had been around for sixty or seventy years post post World War II, um, and they had really in the last fifteen years kind of transformed the European workwear market to be much more utilitarian, moving away from this kind of disposable mindset of um, of cheap workwear and the. Um, the insights that we garnered on, you know, workwear being a consumable item, so it's just something that people go through multiple pairs of pants a year, and they come back and buy, and they're loyal. And, um, you know, so when Josh and I, even before I moved to China, we're talking about starting a business together, um, and we would regroup every year at the ISPO trade show in Germany, and again, late nights, kicking around ideas, and, you know, probably kicked around 50 or 60 ideas. And this was something where, you know, the, there was no seasonality to it. Um, it was something where, you know, we saw a real opportunity to make a, a you know, not a better mousetrap, but, a, a, you know, a new mousetrap and a different mousetrap and, and really create something that, you know, uh, changed, you know, challenged the paradigm of what workwear was in North America. Um, and, you know, that was in 2015. And we been uh, hard at work ever since. 
do you guys have family members or have, have you had your own uh, trade work experience? Like uh, what, I mean, you have to know, learn about something before you even do it, right? I mean, you have to for know, sure. yeah, have for some sure. insight. My grandfather was a kind of a legendary builder where I grew up, and my dad was also a builder as well. Um, and kind of segued into um, some retail store, but he actually built both of the buildings that he houses retail store in. And you know, I went to a state school up in New Hampshire and worked construction crews all through college to kind of pay for what I could and what I could make um, during that time. And and you know, both of us are just really insulated in this in this customer, just because it's it's really our circle of people. We both both grew up pretty blue collar, and where we grew up here in the Northeast is is pretty blue collar. Um, not a lot of my graduating class at my high school was going on to a four-year college. A lot of kids were going into the trades at that time. Um, so we were just really privy to like what these guys were struggling with. Um, you know, I've, I've worn workwear my whole life. Carhartt was basically my de facto go-to casual wear, you know, in my entire life. And there was a lot of limitations, you know, and as we got started to talk to some of these guys and round table and get out there on job sites and we, you know, we had access to a lot of different job sites and a lot of different work areas, just, you know, through our networks. Guys were wearing a lot of like wraparound and a lot of like, you know, products that were outside of worker because they couldn't find what they need. So, you know, just the Northeast with the weather that these guys deal with when they're working year round outside, it was really interesting when Ted and I would get out there and see, you know, Martin Hardware, North Face, Arcteryx, like all these kind of things being used and being split, you know, kind of sprinkled into the, the, these guys' workwear quivers. Um, we did a lot of like gear laydowns with a lot of guys, a good friend of ours is a bridge deck reformant, uh, repair foreman for a big company here locally called SBS. And we would, you know, spend a lot of time in his house and he would lay out his entire gear kit for the week and what he would wear from like base layer to everything. And looking at the weather all week, cause he had to be pretty dialed and stuff had to be clean. And, you know, there was maybe 20% of like actual workwear brands in his quiver. And, you know, most of it was in like footwear. So these guys that just, they couldn't really find what they needed to do the job. So they were just going out and, and purchasing stuff from other categories and using it as workwear. And, you know, that opens up a whole nother can of worms because it's not really made to it's be. It's not made for that. It's yeah, not, it's not made enough, to be a, right? a, a bridge deck repair form, yeah. which is like a super gnarly job, you know? I've noticed a proliferation of workwear companies in the 20 years I've been doing this. Uh, most of them seem to be high end, um, some from Europe, some domestic. Why do you think there's been a, a proliferation or, or am I wrong that there hasn't been? Um, you know, I, I can let Ted jump in this a little bit. There's definitely some new workwear brands around. We don't really see a lot of of maybe high end, maybe some of the European players that have kind of tried to come into the market, but their style just doesn't really work with the U.S. tradesmen. Um, we kind of see the opposite. And what we've seen in the last few years is like a real kind of downgrade in a lot of quality um, as they kind of as everyone kind of reaches out for where the new place is where they can exploit cheap labor and make the cheapest you know workwear that they can possibly make like it's just this kind of we see like a real race to the bottom and they want you know that kind of engineered obsolescence some of these big dog brands because it goes under the radar the guy spending you know 40 to 50 to 60 bucks he doesn't really see that he's buying seven eight nine ten pairs of pants a year he doesn't really notice it where like you know the bigger higher price tag point of course is going to raise some eyebrows because you know, no one's done it in the category. We, we, we've done it purposely because you can't make stuff as good as we want to make it in the U.S. and have it not cost this much. But it's also time for this category to be disrupted. You know, this guy, he can afford better clothing. It's not just the, the, the white color guy that can afford to wear nice stuff. And like, yeah, if you make it the right way, um, it's going to have a lot more durability and a lot more performance. But, you know, with that comes cost, you know. There's, you know, we can get into it a little bit later on the interview, but there's a lot of issues that come with that super cheap, devalued kind of throwaway workwear product, you know. Ted, what is one of those factories in China look like where they're making garments? How, how many people are in there? And, and like, is it a sprawling warehouse of nothing but sewing machines? What's it like? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the majority and, and not to correct you, but the majority of workwear is not no longer made in China. China is way too expensive for workwear and for the for the category specifically in North America. So you're looking at countries like Laos, uh, which was where we made a lot of our workwear, um, uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, countries with you know sub hundred dollar a month minimum wage. Um, you know these factories are indeed large warehouses. A lot of them are unair conditioned. Our factory in Laos was unair conditioned. Uh, our parts of, parts of it were unair conditioned, and it was um, you know twenty five hundred. To three thousand workers making, you know, five, six, seven thousand pair of pants a day, mm. um, and you know, really focused on output, and you know, not necessarily focused on quality, and so it's just, just really, you know, repeatable, whatever kind of. Um, 
they're not applying much technology to the product. Now, the, the factory that I work for, again, they really focused on quality was kind of a, a positioned on the higher end. Uh, but we did have some you know, opportunities to visit some other factories that were really just focused on mass and output. Um, you know, I don't really want to get into some of like the conditions and details. I mean, I think people have seen that. And I think it's everyone's perspective is different because, you know, what might be terrible for us is actually for the local worker, they're happy. Uh, a wage. And, it's, it's a job. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, So it's really tough to, to have a, a, you know, a, a, you know, me just you know, living it for so long, have like a, I said, like a, a negative bias towards it. But I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, the average American consumer would not believe where their stuff is made. If they went over there, they would, you know, just from the roads that lead up to these factories to getting into the factories and especially in the country, the the real uh, developing countries like Bangladesh and Indonesia and, and Myanmar and, and, Ethiopia and um, Sub-Saharan Africa is actually like the new destination for sourcing. Um, and because of uh, there's some really um, preferential duty treatment, um, especially in Ethiopia with the U.S. Um, so I think there's zero duty. So it kind of drives the big brands to go there because they're chasing, you know, they're paying, you know, anywhere from, you know, 22 to 32 percent duty on some of these goods, but between pants and T-shirts. Um, and so you go to a country like Ethiopia, where maybe it's a little bit less productive, but there's no duty. You actually end up saving quite a bit, um, but the skill is much less, right? I mean, China, they've been sewing garments for 40 years. Vietnam has been sewing garments for 25 years. Bangladesh, similar, 25 years. So you do have, even though it's a developing country, this skill is, has been developed and you're on the second and third generation in some of these countries, whereas the sub-Saharan African countries, you're still on like the first five or six years of this journey with these guys. And so the quality is just um, continues to deteriorate. You guys are committed to making your clothes in the U.S. Uh, I know why that's important. Why do you think it's important? I mean, I think there's a, a few, um, say, like pillars or, or kind of buckets as to why we think it's important. I think when we first started out, um, you know, one of the things that we were obviously passionate about making it here, we had, we had both made a lot of stuff in Asia. I mean, living in Asia and Josh was producing or, or working for a, a helmet company that produce plastic mold injected helmets in China. And, you know, we wanted to, I don't want to say prove it could be done here, but I was importing a ton of fabric from Polartec and Lawrence Mass. And we were importing, you know, cotton from the Carolinas and, and FR fabric from Georgia and producing it in the U.S. and then doing the cut and sew, I'm producing it in China, doing the cut and sew, and then sending it back to the U.S. to be sold. And, you know, there was, you know, seeing the landscape of technical textiles really still exists here, um, just the cut and sew didn't. Uh, and so, you know, the um, aspect of being able to, all right, well, let's, you know, find the best fabrics that are made in the USA, find the best factories that are making stuff here and and really prove that we can do it better here. Um, and at the, you know, the second bucket is at the time and, and still for us, um, you know, we're able to manage everything. You know, our, our main factory is 40 minutes down the road. So I can go down there and literally there's, you know, you have a problem, you wake up at, at 7 a.m., you can be down there for 7.30 for coffee and, and solve the problem. Um, and so like that, that's really uh, important. And then, you know, I've been saying this for, you know, seven, eight years, I saw it happening in like the early two, you know, say like 2013, 2014, is that regional supply chains uh, is, is kind of where things were headed. And a lot of brands that were producing in, uh, and I saw it on, on the European side but a lot of brands that were producing in China were moving stuff back to um, the Lithuanias and the Polands and just to be able to you know cut out some of the transit time cut out some of like the um, you know this offshoring the negative nature of, of what that you know South Asian manufacturing is um, and so you know we we kind of believe that like a regional supply chain you know whether it's you know obviously made in USA is important for us but regional something where you can go and deal with problems on a, in short notice um, you know there's less language barrier there's less time zone barrier the, the, the transit time is is much less um, and then you know fast forward to 2021 when a lot of the global brands across all industries not just apparel are having tremendous supply chain issues uh, with stuff overseas. It's the guys that have, you know, regional supply chains, regardless of U.S. or not, are the ones that are able to succeed and, and are the ones that are going to have goods for, you know, this fall and into next spring because the, the situation overseas isn't good. So, you know, kind of a, a few different factors and, and some that have taken longer to play out. But, you know, really, we believed it could be made better here. We just wanted to, you know, support American jobs and we're supporting American workers. And we thought that that, you know, uh, being able to prove it, we could do it here, uh, was important to this category and not just, you know, plug into, you know, a factory that um, in Asia that, 
you know, was producing for eight other brands and competitors. And, um, and, and yeah. where are the clothes made Josh, uh, physically? Um, so, we, you know, we have uh, multiple kind of factories in supply chain. Our main factory is located here in Massachusetts. Uh, we also have some partners in the Carolinas. Um, some of the hatware is made in California. Um, we have some shirt making in Texas. But the bulk of it is kind of set up in Massachusetts. And, you know, we're, we're pretty protect, protective of um, kind of like our contractors and our supply chain because um, it is super competitive. Um, and we've worked really hard to kind of get these guys to the place where, you know, we have majority capacity in a couple of places and we're kind of humming along. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that, that kind of want some of the secret sauce of what we're doing. You know, we're selling a, a pant at a price point that the biggest workwear brands have not been able to achieve um, with success and with growth. So, you know, it's it, and take a touch on it a little bit, but it's a pretty incestuous world and, and brands will follow um, from thread to finish right up the line and try to kind of come in and, and, and take some of your manufacturing. It's a, it's a way that it's a tactic that's used. So, um, but I can't say like location wise, like a lot of our stuff's made here in our home state in Massachusetts. We have some product where the fabric's actually milled here in Massachusetts and the pants are sewn here. So 100%, you know, made that hyper locally, um, which we're really proud of as well. I've heard from uh, companies, uh, you know, in other industries, it can be difficult to find subcontractors to make stuff here. Did you guys have difficulty finding good manufacturers and subcontractors to sew your garments and the fabric? I mean, yeah, yes and no. I think, um, you know, we did certainly when we were first navigating, I had, you know, neither one of us had any background making anything in the USA, really. Um, you know, it was something where, you know, all of our uh, supply chain uh, experience had been overseas. So the first year, year and a half of navigating and sampling, and we bounced around from a couple of factories um, were, um, I would say challenging a lot of it because they, we, you know, factories didn't want to do different levels of like the tech, technical applications that we were looking for. You know, we wanted to seek out the best workmanship and, and advanced patterns. And, uh, you know, you look at a lot of brands and, uh, that produce stuff they, you know, say call quote unquote, you know, workwear or work pants that are actually lifestyle brands, uh, made in the USA. And this stuff's all produced in one or two factories out in California. And there's very little differentiation between the product. And that was something that was really important for us. So to find that factory in the beginning was, um, a little bit challenging and took probably about a year to land, um, in the right place for our, our pants and, and kind of technical products. Um, but, the you know that is that that you know that's now our moat right like we did the hard work we put in the hard work we were able to you know coach a factory up and, and get them to a level that we can produce the quality that we want um and you know we're controlling a lot of their capacity and there's uh, you know a lot of people are chasing what we're doing now and you know running into the the factories that aren't willing to produce at this you know technical level that that we're at you mentioned some of the fabrics are made here are they all made in the u.s and what about like the, you know, zippers, snaps and those things? I mean, my understanding is there's like one company that makes all the zippers in the world. Is that correct? Right. I mean, pretty, pretty close. Yeah. I mean, YKK is uh, the, the industry leader. They're actually um, not the largest. There are definitely some larger, say, like um, no name players in China, um, generic for just generic uh, components uh, for closures and stuff like that. Um but yeah, we um, we source all the materials from the U.S. So fabric, part of it's coming from Massachusetts. The rest of it's coming from South Carolina, uh, with U.S. cotton and 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 nylons. Um, and then all of our trims are coming from yeah YKK and other military suppliers for trims and snaps. Um, and and everything is even our like uh, pocket lining, fusing, everything is made here. Um, and you know that's also something that's you know was challenging to orchestrate and put uh, pull together to try to find all the different components at the level that we were looking for. Mm. Josh, you told me at the JLC live show that workwear has a surprising uh, environmental impact. Can you can you tell? listeners what you were telling me at the jlc live show yeah i mean i think you know everyone's pretty hyper aware of what's happening like in fast fashion and there's a lot of press in and around like you know how wasteful some clothing is i mean there there's an argument to be made that workwear is probably the most wasteful clothing category in the states you got it's just because you're using so much of it is that is that why because i think is, people in, you know would say fashion well you know you don't even wear the garments out before it's out of style but right. you're saying that people go through m multiple pairs of pants annually right multiple pairs of pants in a week 
you know, we have, you know, we've got customers that tell us they go through multiple pairs of pants a week, let alone a month, let alone a year. And, you know, with a lot of this devalued kind of, you know, cheap Walmart styled product, um, you know, that's kind of what they're banking on. They're banking on work where to get blown out in, in a short period of time and you to kind of keep continue to kind of rebuy it. But, you know, there's definitely an argument to be made. It's, you know, the fact that it's also all offshore, there's a massive carbon footprint for all this product as well, too, you know, 90 five to 98 percent of of all the workwear is imported so you, you factor in the carbon footprint you know the consumption levels how fast guys are blowing through stuff and how it's just all destined for a landfill and it's sort of like this category that just kind of goes under the radar in terms of um you know what's really happening um in terms of like the waste you know we've done a really interesting thing we've developed a program called the patina program where um any kind of return goods we offer a warranty on all of our products so we'll get some stuff back for repairs and we'll also get some stuff back from guys um, that are just, you know, they're going to buy some new stuff and they send it back to us because they know we have this program. But we fix and repair all this pants. We take all samples, all blems, all used items, and we resell everything um, in a program called the Patina Program. And it's just, you know, one of our – we drop this product out there even if it's a couple hundred pieces and it disappears in a couple hours because, A, it's more affordable. Um, but you have to be making clothing that's – you know, well made enough in the first place, using best in class fabrics in the first place to be able to repair them. To be right. able to otherwise give, they're just worn out and there's yeah, nothing to repair, or right? give them a second life. And and so you know we're really focused on that, and we're going to kind of as you know as our team grows and we can manage it, um, expand upon that program. You see it, you know, with the Patagonias of the world and their one wear program and what that's kind of become. Um, and we're you know we're looking to grow it and expand it, but it's done really well for us, and we're committed, man. I mean, we make hat. Here's like some of our custom hats. This is all Nyko product um, that you we have to use. Tell me what Nyko means. Nyko is a fabric that Ted developed uh, custom with Cordora, um, and this is the same fabric that's in our pants. So we use like excess fabric from our pants um, to custom make hats for customers, custom make hats for ourselves. It's just you know, we are hyper focused on what's going on. This customer, he's an outdoorsman. We're out, we're outdoorsmen. We're really in tune with what's kind of going on right now, and and. Um, you know, clothing and, and how it's purchased and, and how it's dealt with and what happens to it, it's it's a real issue. So if we're going to make stuff here in the States and be committed to, you know, U.S. manufacturing jobs, um, we also want to try to, you know, make it as sustainable as we can. And inherently U.S. manufacturing, just because of the regulations, is a much more sustainable practice in terms of clothing manufacturing than importing garments. Um, I'm sure you guys agree compared to typical workwear, you know, pants, shirts, whatever, uh, your products are expensive. As I recall at the JLC live show, the least expensive pants were what, 200 bucks and no, then they go to three, right? No, the least expensive is 128, and we're definitely like the opposite internet model where typically you go on the internet and you buy something to cut the middleman out and cut the retailer out and save some money. We've kind of approached it uh, in a completely different way where our stuff is two to four X, you know, more expensive than the stuff that's out there, but it's proven to last longer, right? We back this stuff with a guarantee. You can't, I'm trying not to swear on your podcast. You can't, <laughs> you can't BS this customer. He yeah. is a no BS customer. And, you know, Offering a guarantee on your product, if we didn't make stuff that was good enough and strong enough and tough enough and durable, like, you know, we'd be flooded with returns. Our return rate and our exchange rate is very low for our volume, and we're just really, really focused on making the best stuff. You know, my business partner is a complete expert at, you know, making the best product possible for this customer, and he's developed, you know, custom fabrics to do so, and the secret's all in the fabric. You know, a fabric is not going to last long. It's going to blow apart. Um, and that's where a lot of the cost is. And then also U.S. manufacturing is, you know, is more expensive. But if you look at it where if a guy can go through so many pairs of pants a week, a month or whatever, and 16, 20 can last anywhere up to three to five X is sometimes even longer than that. You know, it's the buy once, cry once mentality that this customer is really used to in terms of footwear, in terms of tools and vehicles and everything around his life. He's bought you know, a crappy drill and he, he's bought a crappy compressor. He knows what happens when you buy, you know, low angle stuff. And, and it was a hard battle at first and it definitely disrupted the whole category. Um, you know, no one has sold a $276, you know, work pant to this customer, but Ted and I, you know, not the biggest brands in the country. So it, it definitely has disrupted it. Um, it's changed it. And we have a really loyal following and repeat customer because we're delivering on what, you know, we set out to do and that's just make it better. Ted, the one thing I observed about your uh, pants at the JLC live show was that they are unfinished at the end because you you make them exactly to someone's uh, exact inseam, right? It's like what I remember going to my to with my dad to the formal wear store, right? You know, and when he went to work, he'd wear a jacket every day, and he'd buy pants, and they'd have to be hemmed, right? It, what's up with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean that was something we realized early on. I mean, and and I mean, I I think you you can kind of 
just from um, anthropologically, you can you know walk around and you see how many different body types and body sizes there are. Um, and so, you know, the first kind of uh, R&D collection that we made, we made a couple hundred pants. Everything was in a 32 inseam. And the only feedback negative that we had was that you don't I'm make stuff 32. for tall guys. <laughs> you don't make stuff for short guys. And so, you know, that's like, um, you know, it's a real complexity in an apparel business where the, you know, sizing on pants um, can, can get out of hand very quickly where we have nine waist sizes. And if you have to have 10 inseam sizes, all of a sudden you need to have 90 sizes per color. Um, and that's just unsustainable, certainly for a startup and even for the big guys. I mean, you know, I wouldn't, I think a lot of those guys, they'll skip inseam sizes because it's just, it's too complex. And so, um, you know, we have, we thought, you know, we had the ability to basically combat that by um, buying all of our pants or making all of our pants in a longer length or uh, say a 37 inch inseam. And then we just hem everything to order. And then in that way, we're not missing out on anyone's, uh, any orders due to not having the right inseam length on hand. Uh, and that was kind of, uh, you know, something we, we started in 2017 when we launched our capsule collection and we just haven't stopped. It's kind of grown with the business. We first, we were um, doing everything with, uh, for the first probably 12 months, doing everything with a, um, a tailor shop and it was getting pretty expensive. And then, you know, within one week, the tailor shop told us they were closing. It was like a, you know, a laundry tailor shop. And we put an ad on uh, in the paper and we had a, a, our sewing machine operator had knocked on our door the next day, didn't call, didn't send an email, just knocked on our door, found us. Um, and she's been with us for three and a half years. So mm -hmm. it's uh, was something that was, uh, you know, kind of meant to be. Um, and she does all the repairs um, and any alterations. We do some custom stuff. We we actually do quite a few um, longer that we offer up to 36 inch on our um, website. But we have done some 40 inch inseams for uh, NBA players uh, and NFL players. We've gone up for some bigger sizes just to because they have a, a tough time getting stuff that fits them. And so, you know, we go up to a 46 waist on all of our pants. Um, and so if somebody comes to us and asks us for an alteration like that, we're going to do everything we can to make it possible because we, you know, we want these guys. I, I have a super short inseam, so I'm kind of the exact opposite of like I've never been able to find pants that fit me. So I know personally what that pain is. Um, and so we just try to make sure that that's not something that our customers feel that they can really get what they want. I can't wait to ask you more about the NBA players, but let, let's let's work our way there. Uh, so companies like Carhartt and Dickies have uh, market share well beyond the tradespeople that they used to make clothes for. Now, as you suggest, these are lifestyle brands. You see hip hop artists and famous people wearing them. Um, what do you think it is about the simple enduring styles of workwear that make people want to wear them who aren't tradespeople? You know, I think people kind of lean towards durability. I mean, Carhartt's just an iconic historic brand, right? And they've made a ton of garments in their history in the States. And they've always had deep roots in hip hop culture and always been in and around it. And, you know, it's a family owned company. We have a lot of respect for that brand in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think just like the durability factor and, you know, people want clothing with a purpose um, and something that's designed with a purpose rather than, and you see that a lot even in office wear and, and casual wear now too. Everything's very, very purpose driven. And I think, um, you know, there also might be um, some DIY kind of like, you know, it says something aspirational. When you're, yeah, yeah. When you're, when you're wearing work, I mean, anything you want to add here, Teddy, I don't want to hog all this no, question. No, no. I mean, I think yeah, part of it is like the timeless, you know, there's a few things, you know, on the fashion side, I know this isn't a fashion podcast, but like, you know, there's like a Macintosh jacket, uh, which is like the long trench coat, or there's the Burberry pattern, or there's like, you know, there's a few things out there. And car the Carhartt pants, the utility style carpenter pant is something that hasn't changed in 70, 80, 90 years um, for better or worse. But I think that there's something about that, like stability that people like too. that it's just, uh, you know, something that's in their wardrobe that, you know, they, they know that it's going to, it was, you know, in 25, 30 years ago, and it's probably going to still be in 25, 30 years from now versus, you know, some of these, you know, high fashion things that really are, you know, one offs or are trending within a season or within a couple of months, and then they become out of fashion. And it's just something that's, it's stability. I think that there, there's, there's an aspect of that to it. Um, that just kind of, um, you know, uh, yeah, ad adds to the legacy of, of work wear and what it does. And your Do you have Cars. Celebrities who wear your stuff. Obviously, you got at least one NBA player who's got forty-inch inseam. Which 
That's tall. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I mean, there's definitely been some professional athletes. There's been like a lot of action sports kind of celebrities and stars that we cook through our connections. Um, there's been some big guys in the business world, some some important CEOs and some important um, entrepreneurs. Is it um, the American made that appeals to them or is it the style? Do you, do you hear? What is it that they, they like? I mean, listen, like aspirationally, you always want the best stuff, right? I mean, I know that there's gear and there's jackets and there's shoes that you want, but the price point is what it is. I mean, that's what we've kind of been able to achieve um, by making quality that's that good. Um, you know, like we get a, you'll get a lot of pushback, but it takes like, it, it, you know, someone's on social, get some pushback, but it takes that guy like being served some creative, checking out our website, going in, seeing the price, seeing the pant he wants, and he wants it so bad, there's like, he's viscerally kind of pissed off that maybe it's a $174 pant, he's used to spending 30, 40 bucks for it. So I think, you know, for guys that are higher level and guys that are high income and guys that are celebrities and superstars, like they only run the best gear and everything in their whole lives, right? So they're not even gonna mess, ever mess with anything that's lower angle. So our brand kind of lends itself more to, you know, getting hit up by publicists or getting hit up by people like so-and-so likes your pant, where like they wouldn't really look at a $45 work pant. You know, some celebrities totally would, but you know, when they see something that's premium, um, that aligns with their lifestyle, there's some, you know, some real interest there. Um, so it's been, it's been cool to kind of see that happen. Ted, who would you want to wear your pants if you could just like make them wear them? Oh, that's a, uh, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know. It's, um, we talk about like Tom Brady. We're from new England, you, know, you, <laughs> on, on, you know, the most, the most visible and well, well-known people. Um, you know, but I also think that, you know, there's some, and I, I hate to say this, but there's definitely some, um, you know, some music stars and, you know, how, how they've, ch- you know, they've changed brands by just wearing them one time. And not that that's what we're looking for or anything like that, but I think that, you know, there are several, you know, whether it's, you know, in, in several different genres, it could be a top country star or a top hip hop artist or a top rock and roller um, that, you know, really could could change it. I think that, um, but, you know, we do have, you know, off the record, there, there are a few celebrities and musicians wearing it. It's just about, you know, catching it. You know, we've been on, um, I think we can t- talk about this, but, you know, Kerry Hart is a, is a big customer and, and a, a big proponent and he's married to Pink. And so we had uh, in People Magazine, Kerry Hart next to Pink on the, um, the walk of Hollywood Walk of Fame when she was doing her, uh, her, her star and putting her hands in her star. So there's, you know, we've had some really good placement, but, um, yeah, I don't, you know, we, we make it for everyone. So I don't really have anyone specific that, that I always uh, thought Mike Rowe, would, you know, it lines right up with who Mike Rowe is and what his messaging is, but he has a clothing deal and I'm pretty sure that it's the clothing's offshore. So Mike, if you, if you hear this, you're listening to this <laughs> and you want to wear some American made clothing, we're New Englanders and we'll custom make you some gear, brother. So you hit us up, but we, I love Mike Rowe. I think he's, I think his messaging's great. And, um, yeah, I mean, what Ted touched on is great. Like, yeah, it'd be awesome if like, you know, Yeezy rocked our pants and it could change our brand overnight. Not necessarily on brand, you know. I think that's where Carhartt can really benefit from that European licensee and the work in progress deals. It's much more of a lifestyle brand in Europe, and that's kind of enabled them to really kind of proliferate and cross over into that into that culture. And you know, we you know we've heard about how many of those hats that they've sold and what that hat culturally kind of means for the workwear customer that might post a meme about who's wearing this hat and, and the person who wants to wear it for streetwear. And it's interesting. It's cool to see it. It's cool to see a brand that size kind of navigate what that means and what that means for the heritage of the brand. You know, we're focused on this customer. Um, you know, so the celebrity in our world for this customer, maybe he's like a Johnny Horahan, you know, like, like a local builder that's killing it and crushing it is out there invisibly on social media. And those are the guys we want to get more of in our gear. I don't know. Uh, uh, Let's, can you talk a little bit about the design process? Do you guys design the things uh, and uh, do you prototype and send them out there before you decide you're going to put something into production? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, we do all the designs. Um, we we kind of own the entire design process. So, Ted, are you pro- physically sketching on a drafting table the, how the clothes look like I see on Project Runway? I mean, it, how's I that mean, work? Yeah. yeah, the original the original design. So you know, I'll, I'll sure. back up to, to 2016 um, when we were 2015. We were kind of first starting. We actually did work with um, a design contractor to kind of help us put together some additional ideas. I'm not a designer by trade. I'm more of um, I'd say like engineer, product engineer, and, and developer than um, than on like the creative design side. And I had some initial sketches and some ideas, um, and you know, and things that we wanted design features that we wanted to include. Um, and so we had somebody help us create the design language, you could say, you know, kind of the angle of the pockets and just the aesthetic of what it is. Um, but from that uh, you know, initial 2016 kind of sketches 
um, everything has actually like tr been transposed into what actually works on the job, right? So like we we do make prototypes. We we made you know the initial collection that we made in 2016 was an R&D collection that we shipped out uh, and were able to you know get a, a couple hundred of our friends basically as friends and, and new new um, you know people um, and we got a little press around that and that was kind of our initial test on like what worked, what didn't work, the pockets weren't the right shape, the fit wasn't right, and so we we went back and tweaked that for our kind of capsule collection relaunch in 2017. Um, and then through today, yeah, since since the beginning part of, of, uh, of 2017, all the designs have been done by us. And it's it is a give and take with feedback um, from our customers. Although I can tell you, like the single knee utility and the double knee utility, the shop pan, those designs haven't changed since 2017 um, because, you know, that's the they work. one. one of, they work. Right. And, you know, we've changed maybe a little bit on the fit, but the the pant itself um, hasn't changed and the features haven't changed. I think we're actually getting ready. Um, the, we haven't really talked about it much, but maybe for a new pant, new double knee, single knee utility style relaunch uh, in 2022. Um, that's it. We're exciting. And, and we have some garments out testing uh, right now currently. And, and we have some things that have we've tested for uh, two years and some things that, you know, we fit test because we know the fabric is right. We know the fit is right. Um, you know, these are applications that, that people are asking for that we don't necessarily field test because it's more of um you know an addition to what's already working than actually like a, a totally new development so it's kind of a mix of both but um you know the most important thing is the fabric right and like we could make just a plain pant with a with the new fabric and send that out and that's going to tell us a lot more about you know where the, the pockets need to be because to be honest with you if we're trying to make you know the best double knee pant and that's that's not just the best double knee pant for you know, just for carpenters or fine home builders, it's the best double knee pant for welders and, you know, uh, guys that are doing heavy work and industrial work. It's for pipe fitters. It's for, you know, electricians and, and plumbers and guys that are doing that type of work, too. So we're trying to make something that's really versatile across all categories and not focus on a, a specific trade. And as we grow, we're working on more specific trade things, and those will require a lot more in-depth testing, uh, you know, on uh, each specific application, but we're working towards that. We're still, uh, I think we have like 15 styles in our collection at the moment. So anything that was a complete fail that you tried, people were like, yeah, don't do this. I don't uh, think we swung and missed. Yeah. Not, not Luckily, really. I think, yeah, I mean, I, wood. yeah, I mean, I think there's been some, you know, fit things that have happened. I think there's been some, you know, factory oversights and things that have, you know, been a, some slight hiccups, but on like a pr holistic product level, I don't think anything has missed. Um, and, you know, we haven't had to kill any products. Uh, it's just, it's more from either like the, the menu. I don't want to say that we're immune to <laughs> not doing the right thing, but I think that there's, um, you know, that a lot of it is, is stuff that, that ends up being beyond our control that ends up um, hurting more than kind of um, the development or the, like the input process. So I grew up in Pittsburgh uh, in the 80s and 90s, and as a result, I've always tried to seek out American-made products. I saw the devastation that happened in the Pittsburgh area when you know all the industry left. Um, does it really help the American economy to buy things that are made here, or do the low prices of imported goods help American consumers more? And I know this is not an economic show either, but you know, we, 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 we try to do the right thing. Are we really helping, you know, or is having more money in your pocket better for the American economy? You know, definitely a two pronged answer and get, you can get Ted's take on this as well too. But, you know, we, having traveled around the country and, and tried to source manufacturers and, and been to these places, you know, like you're, you're talking about, you know, in what the garment manufacturing industry used to really be in some of these places and, and how many people it did support, you know, it is still, you know, First and second generation Americans are doing the majority of like the sewing and it's a great like entry level and it's a great opportunity job. It's sort of a sanctuary job for a lot of places. Um, sewing is not something that, you know, Americans are learning. It's a skill that's completely dying. And like I kind of always liken it to like almost like martial arts, like you're finding like pockets of these really talented like martial artists that are really good at sewing because it's 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 a skill and it takes years to learn. Um, you know, supporting American manufacturing, you know, the way we're doing it when you're supporting the dye houses, the fabric mills, the, the garment manufacturing, the, the companies that are producing all these trims and everything, there's absolutely a circulatory effect of support for, for, for these economies and these local economies where these jobs are super, super important and definitely lifeline jobs where some of these communities are just kind of still hanging on. 
Um, you know, and if it wasn't for some of the large military contracts, a lot of these pockets of American manufacturing definitely wouldn't be existing. You know, we're not on here like rah rah waving a flag that American manufacturing is coming back. It's going to change. It's going to come back in certain ways. You know, it takes entrepreneurs like Ted and I to to really have some courage to go out there and be committed to this because it's much much easier to just go to a factory overseas, have them develop your whole program for you. It's much more cost effective. We'd be driving nicer trucks, all these kind of things. Like everything we're doing is hard, and everything we're doing is for a reason to support American manufacturing because it absolutely matters. You know, like we still need to make clothing in this country. It can't be you know made everywhere but but the U.S. It's just. It has to be something that that remains, and you know Ted's been able to really prove that we can make stuff better here. You know, I don't know if you want to jump in at all in here, Ted. I'm pretty passionate about it, as you can tell. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I think just to kind of build on what Josh is saying, it, it is definitely important for the, the communities that we produce in. You know, on a macro level, is it? You know, are we having an impact on global or on uh, domestic GDP? I don't think so, but certainly on a you know on a local level, I would say you know we're probably on a local factory here. They've got 30 employees and. Um, of the business that we're doing with her, we're you know keeping 22 or 25 of them fully occupied year round. Um, so that's a, you know a, a quite a big impact, and we can feel pretty proud about that. Um, you know on a on a small scale. You know I think on a larger scale, um, you look at the it's it's really a lot of it. It's about like the knowledge, um, as as Josh was kind of touching on that like. What happened, you know, we, we made a lot of our clothes here. We made a lot of other stuff here, even in like Silicon Valley. It's no longer Silicon Valley, right? All that chip making has been offshore to Malaysia, to these places that are having, you know, tremendous issues at the moment. And there's really no backup for that. And there's everyone's so reliant on these, you know, kind of say, call them like keystone um, aspects of their products where like, you know, just semiconductor chip shortage affects industries everyone from you know refrigerators to cars to you know to trains and planes um and that's going to affect everything and and not having those those kind of um really key um manufacturing capabilities domestically it definitely hurts um the u.s right because everyone is is hurting and everyone kind of feels it with you know with all the prices going up and and, and you you hear about it in the news and i don't think this is the worst of it right i think the worst of it is still yet yet to come with this um this like, like chip shortage it's just just one great example of it and apparel is the same way where um you know a lot of um what brands are doing and and uh, this is sorry to go a little bit off here but the Asian factories on the apparel side, they've really taken service first, right? So like you go to them, you bring an idea, a sketch, a couple colors, a, a competitor's reference garment, a pair of Carhartts, and you say, all right, I want to make this in these three colors. Um, and they literally do everything. They source the fabric for you. They do the patterns for you. They control the entire value chain so that the American brand actually doesn't really know what's going on behind the curtain. And they like to keep it that way um, because you know then you, you're not able to pick up and move that else somewhere else they control that entire value chain and i think a lot of you know even on the um electronic side that's what a lot of that's done you know apple and these bigger guys they're they're smart and they have the horsepower now but 15 or 20 years ago when the technology was starting to be developed over there it was still really like a black box of okay you have an idea we'll we'll make it for you and give you the finished product but we're not going to tell you how we do it uh, and i think that's really dangerous i mean i think it's really really dangerous to lose that knowledge of uh, of how to build things and how to make things um because of you know the world is going to change and and people don't like what we're doing they don't like our politics they don't for whatever reason they don't like um you know how we conduct our you know uh, foreign policies all these things uh and they're going to make it more difficult for us to kind of um you know, operate because it's to their advantage, right? So without that knowledge base here at home, it makes it really difficult for us to continue to be the, you know, a leader in, in all the areas that we've been a leader for for the last 200 years. So, um, Ted, I'm going to ask you another question. And, and Josh, I know you're wearing headphones, but um, the next question relates to the style of the garments. Do you mind grabbing one of those pairs of pants or your favorite or whatever behind you so for folks sure. who might be watching this can see what we're talking about? For sure. Uh, Ted, I don't know if I'd call your clothes high fashion or runway ready, but they have a simple appealing style. They're primarily, I'm sure, intended to be tough and practical, but I'm also assuming they have to look good, especially if you're going to ask people to spend a couple hundred bucks on them. Um, you know, is that, is that part of it? I mean, do you, it, what, what, how much, uh, aesthetics, uh, play into this? 
I mean, I would say, you know, one of the things that we wanted from day one, it was super important was to have something that was identifiable from far away. You know, we don't have, um, you know, egregious branding. We don't have, you know, it's, it's a little bit more subtle and, and kind of, um, understated, uh, but the designs, the, the back pocket design, the front pocket design, the fit is distinct from 15 or 20 feet away. And we wanted to create that effect of what is this guy wearing? You know, on, on the job site, somebody sees it and says, you know, I've never seen anything quite like that before. Um, you know, what are you wearing and kind of create a conversation, which then creates interest, which then creates demand for the product, right? If it looked like everything else, the back pockets were designed like everything else. The front Why would someone designed, spend more money, right? It's, or, yeah. or, or they wouldn't even, they would just walk by the person that's wearing them and say- Without noticing. Yeah, yeah. without noticing and say, oh, what are those? And so even we have people that aren't, um, you know, they're wearing them casually. They're at the store. They've said, oh, the, our hoodies, for example, that people are coming up and, and they're saying, uh, you know, to other you know customers like where did you get that hoodie i like that because it's a different styling so the aesthetic is really important you know it's got to be functional first um and there's a reason why our back pockets are angled for ease of entry um you know there's a reason why our um you know our, our double knee is, is a bit longer and sits a bit higher uh, there's a reason why our pockets are set away from the body a little bit you know these things that the reason why the the yoke and the, the crotch gusset and the back knee break are the way they are for pure function but it's also kind of generates that um what are those kind of right con yeah conversation piece so it, it it plays a huge role but again it's it's function first but you know with the intention of you know creating something that draws like visual interest into the product it's pretty good looking i got to say thank you any uh have you guys you know you were in the garment business like did you did you end up there did you have this uh, interest in it like how you, how'd you get there I mean, uh, for me, it was I, I started out as an intern my freshman year in college with an apparel company. No interest, no, you know, I, I like clothing. I used to skate, skate, be, you know, a skateboarder and, um, and, still and ride one there's around definitely the, a fashion uh, associated sure, with yeah, that yeah, and, lifestyle, and, and right? The, the same thing with snow sports where it's like, you know, there's there's trends. It's a yearly there's there's new trends that are happening every year. So, um, you know, it was just something that I kind of fell into and have been working in for 20 years, almost 21 years. Um, but certainly not something that I sought out as a, as a career opportunity or, um, or or really became interested in. And, and I, I worked for that company for 10 years and really didn't get interested in the development side of it for the last couple of years. Once I, um, you know, I, we started doing like warranties and repairs. And I started getting involved in that and seeing what went on on the inside of the garment and really became interested in like how they were put together. Um, but even up until that time, the first six or seven years of working in apparel, it was not somewhere I thought I would be. How about you, Josh? Um, you know, I've always had interest in clothing and, and, and style and outerwear and, and all those kinds of things, you know, brandings and, and just kind of consumer mindset is something that I've always had a lot of interest in. Um, and it was able to kind of do a lot of that um, with burn just because when we launched it, helmets were still really not widely accepted. So the premise was trying to take something that was like super dorky that you didn't want to wear and make it into an aspirational accessory. And we were really industry leaders at the time to kind of do that. Um, and there are some similarities, you know, with workwear, you, you'll see some, we saw some guys at JLC wearing some of our competitors stuff, like in the bar, it's just, you know, you look like a complete kook. Like some of these things are just, they might be very functional on the job site, but you know, we care about style and we believe that our customers care about style and our stuff could be at home as at home on a job site or at a football game or, or at the bar. And I think, you know, where we've kind of positioned the brand, we do sell a significant amount of stuff to Canada and a few other places, but Japan's actually like been a really good customer of ours. And that's probably 100% a streetwear play and, and uh, you know, a desire for American made garments over there. And we've been really cognizant to make the styling and to make the product look good enough that there could eventually be naturally some streetwear plays that might happen internationally. And we're not making it look so fluorescent and so crazy and so like logoed out that it, it would never kind of happen that way um you know, mainly because we want to make stuff that looks cool like just mm -hmm. because it's work where it can still serve a function and aesthetically be a cool looking aspirational garment and at our price point that's super you know, important you know we want to make aesthetically the coolest looking workwear in in the game and like that's what we're focused on doing it's been a pleasure talking to you guys thanks so much for being on the show yeah, cool. Hopefully we didn't run on too much. And No, man. You guys are great. So how Jeff, can listeners and their friends see and uh, buy your workwear? Where, where, where do they get it? Where, do they look, where can they look at it? 
Um, we're available online, 1620USA.com. It's 1620USA.com, or you can just Google 1620Work, where we just moved into a new place in Amesbury, Massachusetts. We're going to have a full showroom here in Amesbury for any B2B customers or anyone that wants to come in and, and you know get their guys to try some stuff on, or if you'd like to try some stuff on. It's mainly going to be by appointment, so you can reach out to us online. Um, but we're 100% you know, digitally direct, and we're the only guys on the only website where you can buy 1620 currently is, is our own, 1620USA.com. Uh, either one of you, do you, is there anything you want to ask or tell our listeners before we, uh, go today? Just thank you to everyone who supported us. Thank you to all the customers that have spent more money on work right for the first time. You know, we have an insane repeat rate and we, we appreciate all the repeat business as well too, but it's about the guys that want to support us made that want to support a small American business and want to buy better work where you guys are out there pioneering it and doing the hard work in it given us the feedback to make it better and we appreciate the hell out of you it's all about it's all about our customer for us 100 percent. and and thank you for for all your support and, and and growing with us and we look forward to the future we're making you guys all the stuff you've been asking for and we're hard at work to make more and more gear we've just released our overall we're releasing our coverall we're releasing some high vis stuff we're in the lab working on fr so everything you've been asking we're hard at work trying to get it for you and thank you for your support how about you ted no i mean just yeah same you know we we definitely thank our customers and um you know the I say like the landscape out there is um you know it's difficult for everyone and, and we know that um you know expensive our, our products are expensive but we think that um you know the value is there just to loop back on, on one of your earlier questions where um you know you, you said our stuff is expensive and i would just argue that it's it's actually not expensive um you know for the value that you're getting from the products you know it's lasting longer a lot of our customers you know they're less tired at the end of the day because they're wearing performance fabrics that they've never been able to wear before on the job site. And so, you know, getting in and out of vehicles, going up and down ladders, bending over, kneeling down, just moving around, you're carrying less weight, you're having less resistance with the stretch fabrics. And so, yeah, just, um, you know, we're, we're thankful for all of our customers and, um, you know, our, our repeat rate and engagement of our current customers really speaks for itself on that end. So, Well, I, you know, for what it's worth, that stuff is amazing, and uh, I haven't bought any yet, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> we'll get you a good deal, Patrick, when you're ready. <laughs> Jeff, if you need anything, we'll get you a good deal too, brother. And let us know. Well, I uh, applaud what you guys are doing, and I wish you great success in your business. I, I think it's super cool, and I hope that our listeners will, will t- at least take a look at it and think about it because uh, it, it, it seems amazing, and I, I, I hope it works well for you. I really do. We appreciate you, Patrick. Thank, thank you very you, much. Patrick. Yeah, this is big for us. Any exposure helps greatly, so thank you, bud. Thanks very much for being on the show, guys. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to jo- thanks to uh, Ted and Josh for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send your send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, and review. However you're listening, it helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Get some American workwear. 